Google Twitter abuser from the PowerShell team, uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, Visual Studio Code. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been he hearing a lot about uh, VS Code over the past, I don't know, year, probably more so over the past few months. Um, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with PowerShell in this area, and uh, wanted to sort of go over a high level about how to use the editor, sort of the concept, concepts of the editor, how you can configure the editor, just the general things you need to know if you've never used the editor before. So, uh, so how many of you, of you have actually used VS Code already? Okay, so a lot of people. Um, and who here is a hardcore PowerShell ISE user who still hasn't made the switch yet, but is sort of curious? Yeah, so there's a lot more of you, so it's about half and half here. So uh, my goal really is to show you, uh, especially the people who haven't used it before, generally how to use the editor, and to show you that it's not as you know, scary or confusing as you might think it is, or as other people might have told you that it is. It's actually quite straightforward, uh, as, as long as you understand the general flow of the editor's, editor itself. So um, let's just start with a general overview of the editor itself. Um, the thing that, is the that basically is the most important part of the editor is the thing that you don't actually see whenever the editor starts up, and that is the command palette. If you hit Control shift p then you get this palette of commands, and this basically contains everything that you can do in VS Code. Um, so if I want to do something related to files, I can just type file and then I get the list of commands related to files. So I can see here there, there's a closed folder, there's a new file, uh, focus on file explorer, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so if I go to like open recent, it gives me a list of all the files that I've opened recently. And all of these lists that pop up, you can type within them to search within them. So if I wanted to say something like uh, PowerShell, then any files that have PowerShell in the name uh, show up here. So if you press uh, Control P, you get a similar experience. But uh, this Control P menu actually has some more interesting things inside of it. If you press the question mark, it gives you a drop down of some extra commands. So it's almost like having another sort of command line in your editor. You have some uh, cool things you can do, like edit debug configurations, or uh, showing editors in various groups, managing your extensions, restarting tasks, showing your task list, et cetera. So, um, it's definitely good to explore what some of these things are, are, are allow you to do. Um, also, you have things like Control-Shift-O, which allows you to navigate uh, between symbols in the open file. So um, this, as you can see here, we have a list of things that are obviously things that come from within the file. They're not files themselves, but they're actually the headers of this markdown file. So I'm basically navigating through this markdown file by using my arrow keys. I can also search for specific things like debugging, and I can jump directly to those. So the command palette is kind of like this multi-purpose tool for uh, knowing how to do things and knowing how to get around in your code base. It's, it's pretty awesome. So I think that if there's nothing else that you take from uh, this session about VS Code itself, the command palette should be the thing that you look into the most. I think that that's really the key component of this thing that makes it really powerful, uh, while also remaining really simple. Like, it's really straightforward. As you can see, this editor is just a an, uh, an, uh, file pane and a file browser and some icons, and that's pretty much it. So all the power is kind of hidden. You can, you can dig into it through the, uh, through the command palette. So uh, as far as files are concerned, they, we have the folder browser on the left-hand side, and this gives you an overview of the files that are in your current folder. You can sort of dig through these files, and if you click a file, then it opens it up in a temporary editor pane. Uh, if you click to another file, then it will just open that file as well in the temporary editor pane. And if you double click on the file, it will keep that file open because it, they assume that you want to uh, keep editing the file or looking at it. And uh, th there's a distinction between having a folder open and not having a folder open. Um, if you create a new window, if you try to hit Control Shift N to create a new window, then you basically just got a blank editor. Uh, if you click the folder browser, there's nothing there. Um, you have an untitled file, you can just start typing and do whatever you want to do. Um, a lot of the editor functionality is not available here because much of it depends on configuration files that are stored within your workspace <laughs> folder. Um, but there's some things you can do. I mean, if you have an extension like the PowerShell extension or I think even the Python extension, um, you still get some level of language support. So let's say if I uh, switch this to, uh, if I use the change language mode, uh, command, 
I can set this file to PowerShell, even though we, we haven't saved this file yet, uh, we haven't set it to a PS1, anything like that. Uh, it turns on the PowerShell language mode, so now the, the integrated console pops up, and you can start typing commands and get uh, IntelliSense for those. Uh, and also, if you just type git process and hit F5, then it will run that script, and you get all the, the debugging experience. So there's some level of experience here, but generally, if you're working on projects, you're going to open a folder. Uh, so as you can see in this editor, I've opened the, the folder for the plaster uh, module that Keith Hill and I work on. And uh, we have a lot more stuff visible here. Um, and this VS Code folder is where all the VS Code specific settings for this folder live. So you can see we have a launch.json, which is for debugging settings, which I'll go into later. There's a settings.json, which we'll also talk about later, and a task.json, which we'll talk about later. Um, so there's a few icons that will pop up whenever you hover over this area for creating new files or folders or refreshing uh, the folder tree or collapsing or expanding, that kind of thing. There's also this open editors area for keeping track of all the lists of files that you currently have open. So basically any tab that you have open is going to be reflected in this list at the top. And also uh, another big thing that you get from having a folder open is source control integration. So if you have a .git folder inside of your workspace path, uh, that will be reflected here and we'll go into the source control view next actually. Um, let's see if there's anything else I'm missing here. Yeah, so, um, so that sort of covers the, the folder browser. And by the way, anytime that anyone has any questions about anything, any of these things, please feel free to stop me. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, so we'll look at source control now. So there's this icon on the left side that's called source control. Uh, and this area has been undergoing a little bit of changes over the past uh, release or two. But uh, for now, since we're using a Git repo, we'll just show what it looks like to work with Git here. Um, you can see that there are a few files that are listed as uh, being modified. So you can tell that by this little M uh, icon to the side. And if you click one of them, then you get the diff. And I think it just activated PowerShell mode. Let me hide that away. You'll get the diff of the changes you've made based on what's currently in the repository, your latest commit. So uh, that's, that's really helpful for dealing with you know, any changes you've made, anything you want to commit to your, your Git repository. If you want to actually stage this file to be committed, then you can go over to the editor, or sorry, to the pane here and click the plus sign, and that adds it to be staged. And uh, also, if you don't want to have the file staged anymore, you're like, oh, I did that by accident, then you can click the minus sign, and it puts it back into the, uh, the unsaved changes. Um, so yeah, pretty much for any other file, you can see diffs, the nice color coding, everything. So that's really helpful. Um, and this drop down here also gives you some more things you can do. You can pull from your uh, remote repository. You can actually push commits to your remote repository. Um, I think publishing is uh, when you push to the remote. I don't know if this is, yeah. Uh, so let's see, and you can do, you can basically commit out your files uh, under your last commit. Some of these things may actually be coming from an extension I have installed, so I, I'm not sure if they're built in, but, um, but yeah. So this is really helpful. I mean, you can do pretty much anything you need to do with Git here in the editor. You don't need to mess with the command line very much. Uh, if you want to make a commit, you can type a message here. So, you know, whatever commit message, that's not, not a good one. Uh, hit control enter and it will actually make the commit for you in your local repo. Then you can use the other tools to push those changes to your, uh, your remote repository. Yep? Do you know if they're adding support? I don't know. So uh, one thing I also forgot to mention, uh, we have a special guest in the audience today, uh, Daniel Ims, otherwise known as Tyriar. He's a member of the VS Code team. Uh, he's done a lot of the really cool stuff that has come in the last you know, six months to a year on the editor. So uh, we've got him here also in case we have any questions like this. So do you know if there's sub-module support in, uh, in Git? Yeah, so uh, really the answer is at some point anything can be supported because now the source control feature in VS Code is open to extension. Um, so this actually just happened, I think, in the last release, right? 1.11, 1 um, the source control APIs are now available and um, people are working to put TFS support and probably other things like Mercurial, et cetera, um, into the editor. So that'll be pretty, pretty interesting. Um, what else is interesting about that? I'm sorry? Jumping back real quick to when you had the uh, uh, workspace that hadn't saved the file yet, you went and added PowerShell to it. 
Is there a way to, or is there going to be a way to, to version control which PowerShell you want to go into that window? Hmm. Like if I want to work in five or six. Um, that, yes, actually, so uh, I'll go through that in, in the settings part of this. I, I can tell you how to do that. So, let's see. You want to show the output pane? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I'll, I'll show that in a little bit because I'm going to show output panes in general. Um, one cool thing that uh, you can do, you, you can install this extension called GitLens, and uh, what that allows you to do is see real-time information about um, previous commits, Okay, let me get out of this view. I'm in the wrong view right now. So for instance, if I go to uh, this build.saki.ps1 file, if I click one of the lines, there's this little pop-up here that says uh, commit hash and a commit string. So this extension allows you to get real-time information from your Git repository like right built in in the file. If you hover over a line, it tells you who made the change, how long ago it was, what specific date it was, and uh, what their commit message was. So uh, this is not something that comes built in the VS Code. This is through an extension called GetLens. Uh, I've got a link that I'll uh, post afterwards, but uh, you can get it from the, the gallery using just the name GetLens. And I'll show you how to ex install extensions in a little bit. But uh, I highly recommend this extension because it does a lot of really cool stuff. I think it even does um, some cool history. GetLens show current branch history. Uh, some cool history outputs. So it gives you r more rich information about the uh, previous commits, even like giving, getting a commit ID, um, comparing it with the previous commit, et cetera. So it really sort of amps up the level of Git support in VS Code. So I highly recommend using that extension. Let's move on. All right, so uh, there's this concept of panels in VS Code. Uh, so right now, all you see is the editor and the file browser, but there is um, a set of panels that you can pull up that give you extra information about what's going on in your project. So if I go click the View menu and click Output, the first thing we'll look at is the Output menu or the Output panel. So there's this drop down here that gives you a list of all the different types of output that you can see. And uh, a lot of different extensions will have output. Um, some things in VS Code itself will have output. Uh, if you've used the PowerShell extension in the past, you might remember that if you use F8, there was an output pane for PowerShell output, which really sucked, um, but good to be moving away from that now. Um, but let's say, like, uh, like Jay recommended, we'll go to Git output, and you can see the actual commands that VS Code's running in Git to get all the information for its, its uh, UI. Uh, and a lot of this is Git commands I've never seen before, so that's kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, so this is kind of a good place to go to see logs for different extensions and, and such as that. It, you'll see your task output here too uh, with the old task model. Um, so that one's not, not very interesting, but you might run into it every now and then. There's also the problems display. And this is pretty useful because if you have any syntax errors in your code, um, they will show up here. So if I in introduce a syntax error into my PowerShell script, you'll see that there is a list of errors for that here. Um, so that makes it pretty easy to uh, just get an overall view of all the errors across all the files in your project. So I'll undo that. And also, uh, if I use anything like uh, an alias, then you'll see that there's like a warning here for using the alias, and I can jump to where that is in the file. And then also, for those of you who don't know, there are these little quick fix icons where you can click the light bulb and do a quick fix on this to replace it with the actual alias itself. So um, this is kind of a good place to see the overview of all the things that uh, you might want to address in your source files, so uh, that's really useful. The debug console uh, was also sort of a facet of the PowerShell extension in the past. It was also crap for PowerShell um, because really all you had was just some really slowly written output and a simple input prompt where you could write commands, but it just didn't feel right for PowerShell. But for other languages like JavaScript and TypeScript, uh, it's really helpful. If you do debugging in, in many of the languages in, in VS Code, you'll see the debug console being used for that. So you have the interactive experience. Some of them actually even allow you to output objects to the console so you can dig into the, uh, the object tree. Um, so it's, it's pretty useful. And then last but not least, there is the terminal, which some of you are probably familiar with by now. Um, this is actually a terminal emulator built into VS Code. And 
if you think this is really awesome like I do, then you should be thanking this guy right here because uh, the VS Code team was not interested in adding a terminal emulator into VS Code, and, but then Daniel went and just did, over, did it over a weekend and they actually added it. So round of applause for, for Daniel here for adding that. <laughs> And the important thing to me is that not only did they make a terminal, terminal emulator, they also made an API that allows me to launch my own process here so that I can give you the integrated console experience. Um, it's really simple, but I mean, sorry, the API itself is really simple, but it, it makes me capable of doing really cool stuff for you guys. So um, to me, one of the biggest benefits of VS Code itself is that it has excellent APIs that allow me to do really awesome stuff. Um, so if you're ever interested in writing VS Code extensions, definitely check out their documentation because uh, it's, it's really well designed and uh, I think you'll have a lot of fun writing extensions. But anyway, the, uh, the terminal view, you can run any shell here. Uh, you can run command.exe, you can run PowerShell. If I click the plus sign here, you'll see that it just runs PowerShell.exe. Uh, you can run PowerShell Core 6, you can run Bash for Windows, you can run uh, Z Shell or Fish or anything like that if you're on uh, Linux or Mac OS. It does everything, uh, and actually it's extremely fast. Like, I'm actually impressed how fast the output of this terminal is compared to something like uh, Commander or Conemu. Um, if I type uh, GPS here, it's, it's just blazing by, it's crazy. I and mean, this is all HTML-based UI, which is unbelievable. Um, so I don't know, I think this is a pretty big achievement because this makes it easy to stay just totally within the editor. You can do everything you need to do here and not have to have separate windows. Any questions so far on any of those things? Cool. So let's see, yep, mention all those things. So tasks are interesting because uh, this is a way that you can run external commands to do things for your development workflow and get the output in a way that VS Code can kind of help you see it better. Um, so for instance, uh, if I go to this VS, .vs code folder, I'll click task.json, and there's this JSON file that has configuration for tasks that you might want to run for your project. So this, this file is in my project folder, it's, everything is specific to the code that I'm working on right now. Um, so you, you have some really simple settings you can, you can configure, basically the, uh, the path to the, the program to run, and in the past, I think that the, um, the restriction was your task.json has one exe or one program that you're going to be using and then you have different configurations of, of parameters that you send to that program but that might be changing right you, can you have multiple exes now uh, configured in tasks um, let's try this. well uh, i think that uh, you can only have like one executable co uh, configured at the top of task.json and then all your tasks are relevant or relative to that executable oh yeah yeah this, this game is changing it's yeah, so it's becoming more flexible and it's also possible for extensions now to provide their own tasks or maybe at least problem matchers right now, but maybe tasks later. But um, yeah, the idea is that this, this system will get more, uh, more flexible, which is gonna be really helpful for uh, doing um, tasks across different platforms. So if you have uh, some PowerShell code or some also some JavaScript or TypeScript code, you can have tasks for both those things. But for now, we, we see a task.json that is totally for PowerShell and um, we can configure what arguments to send to the exe by default. So I'm saying no profile and execution policy bypass because I just want to run scripts. And then my list of tasks, uh, I have a clean task for cleaning up all the sort of uh, published ready files for the project. I have a build task for doing what amounts to a build in PowerShell. Um, a task for building our help with Platypus. Uh, script analysis task and install task that allows you to take your current module files under development and install it into your PS module path, etc. So you basically see all the commands that um, we are running for these tasks and VS Code doesn't care what you're running. I mean, you're basically telling it what to do. So um, now that you have this list of tasks, you can load up the command palette. So, so control shift P type uh, task and you'll see this list of task related commands. So I'm gonna to go to the run task menu. I'll hit enter on that. And uh, you'll see now that we have the list of all the tasks that are defined in this task.json file. So this is all integrated into the UI. VS Code reads this JSON file and then takes all the task names, puts it into the UI. So if I wanna build my code, I can just say build and it will pop open the output window for the task and show you the output of the sake script that builds this project. Uh, one of the cool things that just changed recently is that there's a new way to run tasks in uh, VS Code um, and all it requires is to change the version 
to 2.0 in this file. And when you do that and run this task, you have to restart first. But uh, let's see, reload window. But now I can run my task, build. And it actually opens it in an integrated terminal window to get the full output for PowerShell. So you get the full colored output and any of the problem matchers you have defined, which I'll discuss in a little bit, um, will also be triggered so that in the problems pane, you'll see uh, items here if any of your output has errors or anything to, to deal with. I don't know if we have any problem matchers defined in this file. Let's see. Okay, yeah, we have one here. So a problem matcher is basically like a regex. It's a regex that says, in my task output, look for a particular type of output that fits this regex. And when it does, we want to say what level of error this turns out to be. So um, I think we're defining this probably for compilation output, but probably also for pester uh, test output. It just makes it really easy to have that problems window, have your output in an easily consumable way where you can click around and go to the files where this stuff happens. So you don't really need to read your output really closely and then go find the file and the line number where everything happened. This, this is a way for you to define a way to, um, uh, to make that easy. Uh, now that we can provide problem matchers as part of the extension, I want to try to bring some default problem matchers into the PowerShell extension to uh, make this easy so you never have to do it for anything PowerShell related. You sh should just be in the box. Let's see if there's anything else relative to tasks. And uh, yeah, basically the only other thing is, um, this is really good for running um, sake or invoke build scripts if you use any of those uh, projects. Um, that's basically what we're doing in this script. We're just running a uh, sake script. Yeah, so what we're calling invoke command. Oh, no, we have it here, invoke sake. So our task just runs invoke sake and points at our build script. So all of our build definition stuff is done in PowerShell and we just use this simple file to say, go run it. So, yeah, so also the, uh, there's the, this debugging pane that's pretty cool, but we'll get back to that later because I'm going to talk about that in context to, uh, to PowerShell. But as far as other cool stuff is concerned, um, there's a feature called uh, Hot Exit, which, uh, to be honest, I think that name is a little bit disturbing if you think about uh, it for a little bit. But, uh, but really, this concept comes from uh, editors like Sublime Text, where if you have uh, an unsaved file, and you, you need to close your editor for some reason, like you need to reload it to upgrade an extension or something like that. Um, when you close the window and reopen it again, it actually re returns your uh, unsaved file to the state where it was. And this is another feature that, that Daniel worked on and, and brought into the editor, so that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. I think Joel was waiting on this one before he switched over to VS Code fully, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, so that one's pretty awesome. Uh, there's also a markdown preview. Um, so if you've never written a markdown file before, you probably will start writing one because that's sort of the, the documentation standard for open source projects these days. So if you want to see what your file might look like on GitHub when it's actually rendered, you can hit Control Shift V and it will render the uh, markdown output for you in sort of an HTML fashion so that you can look at it and make sure that you didn't make any mistakes like with your uh, link syntax or anything else like that. There's a weird issue in VS Code where if you've got your uh, UI zoomed in, it kind of makes it squeeze the scroll bar in. I don't know what's going on there, but you can at least see the output uh, shows you um, what your file will look like. And if you open it side by side, so let's say if I, I think uh, this window, if I say uh, edit side by side and I go into the editor itself, uh, the preview pane tracks where the editor is and if as you type it actually uh, uh, updates the preview in real time. So it's kind of nice for if you're writing documentation a lot and you want to see the output in real time as you're typing it, you can get that from the preview pane. So I like that, I like that feature a lot. And uh, there's also this thing called Zen mode. Uh, if you're the type of person who likes to really get focused in on what you're writing and you don't want to see all this extraneous UI, you can hit uh, Control K, then release Control, then hit Z, and then it basically gets all the UI out of your way so you can just see the text itself. Uh, kind of nice if you're just like, you know, writing documentation, writing journal entry, writing uh, any kind of code that just, you just want to write a script. Uh, probably also good for presentations as well, but I haven't really done a lot of that uh, with VS Code yet, so uh, let's see, I'll get out of that. Uh, and I also mentioned side-by-side -side editing. Um, if you hit control and, what's this, backslash? 
Um, you can get up to three side-by-side -side windows. So if you have like a super wide monitor, you can uh, put those editors side-by-side, -side, which is kind of helpful. Uh, another thing worth mentioning is that uh, some people have mentioned in the past, if you use the integrated terminal a lot and you have a wide screen, it kind of sucks to have really wide editor, really wide terminal at the bottom, but uh, Daniel is actually fixing that at some point in the near future, I think, uh, to have the terminal possibly be showing up on the right side, right? Uh, yeah, in the coming months. In the coming months. Like it's, it's something that's on the roadmap. It's not necessarily on the plan at the moment, but um, they definitely uh, decided to uh, look into that. Okay, so configuring the editor. Um, this is one of the places where I think people get tripped up a little bit because there's no nice UI for clicking drop downs and you know, clicking check boxes and using those kind of UI elements to set your settings. Everything's done based on JSON, which I think is kind of nice because it allows you to take your configuration and check it in to a Git, Git repo or just you know, transfer it around between computers. So you don't have this configuration stored in some weird binary format for the editor. It's all uh, editable, all readable. Uh, so you can get to the configuration page by, by clicking uh, File, Preferences, Settings, and you can also get there by pressing Control, Comma. But uh, you'll see this window pop up, and this is a major improvement over what it used to be, where it had the default settings file in a one pane, and it had your current settings file in another pane side by side, uh, and they weren't really connected, and there wasn't really a search, search UI. So um, this is much better than it was before. So if you've used it in the past and you thought it sucked, try this now because it's, uh, it's a lot better. But uh, the, it gives you the list of, at the top, the commonly used settings, and also all the uh, extension-specific settings in their own sort of uh, expandable sections. And uh, you can really easily search the settings. So if I type in PowerShell, you get all settings related to PowerShell, especially the ones that come with the PowerShell extension. So that's kind of nice. Uh, another thing is you can click this little pencil that shows up whenever you hover over one of the settings and say replacing settings, and it will automatically go over to your settings file and uh, either put the setting there if it's not there already or put the cursor on the text you need to change to change that setting. Um, for other settings, like this files.autosave setting, if you click the pencil, it gives you all the possible options for that setting. So you don't need to know ahead of time or look at the documentation. You can just go and click whichever one of these you like, and then it puts it over into your file. So it's a lot easier now to, um, to manage your configuration settings. Also, you can go here and type in uh, specific settings, and it will get IntelliSense for all the potential settings here. And even um, it will auto-complete the default value and also any potential uh, uh, values for the setting itself. So uh, that's it's pretty nice. I mean, I, I kind of like it, like it doing it this way. It's a lot different than what was in the ISC because obviously you had a UI there, but I think that once you have used this a little bit, it's really easy to get used to it. What is the main difference between user settings and workspace? That's a great question. So uh, there are two types of settings in VS Code. One is user settings and one is workspace settings. User settings is global to your installation of VS Code. So um, user settings get stored in your user profile path under $home slash VS Code, I think. Um, and th they're an adjacent file on your machine, so you can easily pull that down from a Git repo, whatever. Workspace settings are specifically for the current folder that you have open. So if I click workspace settings, you'll see that uh, some different things show up. And that's because those come from the settings.json in my .vs code folder. So for any setting in VS Code, you can override it in your individual projects. So if you have a project that uses a different um, code style or a different um, setting for tabs versus spaces or a different version of PowerShell, for instance, uh, you can set that in your workspace specific settings so that anytime you open that folder, those settings get replaced with what is configured for your project. So um, I think this is really awesome because uh, it allows you to have uh, different settings for different needs. So for instance, I have a folder of markdown files, which are basically just my personal notes. In that folder, I have a settings file that auto saves every file as soon as I type anything in it. So all my markdown files are saved immediately. I have uh, settings for uh, the font size may be different or the font itself may be different. You can put like a line to show how wide the file is. But that only shows up in that folder for my notes files. But for my PowerShell projects, I can do things like set the default language. So when you create a new file, it would automatically be a PowerShell file by default, uh, things like that. So uh, 
I think this is a really powerful feature that people should make use of if you're if you're sharing um, your settings between or sorry if you're working on projects with other people. It's a way to enforce things uh, in your project, which is pretty awesome. This also gets checked into your source code, so everybody who pulls down your Git repo, if they open it in VS Code, they'll have these settings applied. So that's a that's a really nice benefit. Any questions on that? Cool. Your personal settings, uh, you can use a, a, like a symbolic link basically in Windows if you have a Git repo. Like uh, a lot of people have what they call a dot .files repo where it's just a repo with all their text-based settings for different programs they use. If you clone that to your computer, you can use a symbolic link or whatever they call it in Windows, I'm not sure, um, to delete the existing file that's there on the VS Code settings path and then symbolic link your repo's file there. And then once you make any changes in VS Code in, in the UI, you can go back to your folder and see that you've got the changes in your, uh, in, your, in your Git diff, and then you can commit those files and push them back up to your repo. So that's a pretty common thing. Um, one of the most popular extensions as well is a, a sync settings extension, which will help you do that. Yeah, I forgot about that one. So yeah, he mentioned there's a, a setting that, uh, sorry, an extension that allows you to sync your settings. I think what it does is it like posts it to gist or something, doesn't it? Yeah, so you don't even need a Git repo for that. You can just have this uh, um, extension installed. And then let me actually uh, search for that one real quick. Yeah, settings sync, I believe that's the one. But uh, yeah, it makes it really easy to sync your settings between different machines. So if you use VS Code on different machines, you can sync your, setting, your personal user level settings file across those machines. Uh, so that's definitely a, a nice thing to try. I need to add that to, to the list. All right. Um, so yeah, just general useful settings. I mean, obviously, you're probably going to want to configure your font size or your font family. Um, I tend to like to use this font called uh, uh, Fira Code. I don't know if that's the way that they pronounce that, but uh, it's a really cool uh, programmer-friendly font that has font ligatures, which is this weird thing where you can have all these uh, not equals and error, uh, sorry, arrows and all kinds of weird text. Um, that's kind of interesting, especially if you like to do funky-looking custom prompts in the terminal. Um, that's that's useful there. Um, there's also uh, insert spaces, which allows you to choose between tabs and spaces and files. Format on save, uh, which you may have seen in the Lightning demo, where if you have a PowerShell file and you want it to automatically be formatted right before you save the file, like if you hit Control S, it will format the file first and then save it. There's also format on type, where you can just get formatting to happen as, as you're typing. You type a block of code, press Enter, it formats it for you. Uh, so those things are really nice. There's another thing that I just added to VS Code recently, which is the files.default language setting. And that allows you to set whatever the language mode is that you would like to have as the default language mode when you create a new file with like control N. Um, pretty useful if you do mostly PowerShell development in VS Code and you want to just you know, hit control N to create a new editor, start typing text, hit F5, then use this setting to set your default uh, language to PowerShell. So uh, it makes it really nice. Uh, there's a files.autosave auto setting. Uh, that allows you to in save your file in some interval, like you type some text, and it may wait for a few seconds, and then save it. Um, stuff like that, pretty interesting. You can also uh, configure a different font size or font family for the terminal. So if you like to have one font for your editor text and a different font for your terminal, you can also configure that. Um, so that's pretty cool. Yep. As far as the terminal goes, is there any plans to add multi-monitor support? I currently use IC steroids with AIC, so I break the output thing out to a separate monitor. Yeah, we had a discussion about that on Twitter recently, and uh, I'm not sure that that's going to be coming anywhere in the near future. There's technical limitations with Electron. Um, with that. Yeah. It's difficult when you create different windows with the UI, the UI shell that they're using, uh, it gets more complicated to communicate things between them. So uh, it's, it's, it would be more costly for them to add that. Um, but one thing that I might be able to do in the PowerShell extension, at least, is um, instead of popping up the integrated console itself into the integrated terminal UI in VS Code, I could potentially pop up a regular terminal window outside of VS Code that you could put on a separate monitor, and then you would have the same integration between the two. Um, so that's, that's a definite possibility that we could look into within probably the next few months. Um, so yeah, that might be helpful. Um, anything else? Cool. So uh, we'll take a look now at uh, theme settings. Uh, one of the cool things about VS Code is that you can change uh, syntax themes and also more recently workbench themes. Um, 
this is pretty interesting. And there's also a lot of themes on the gallery. So if you go uh, searching for like theme extensions, there's just a ton of them out there. And uh, you'll probably realize that most of them were written by Brandon Padgett because he basically just wrote a PowerShell script that takes all of the themes for Sublime Text and just rips them and puts them into uh, ex individual extensions for, uh, for VS Code, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, there's a, a lot of really great themes. There's already themes built in. So if you hit Control-Shift-P, type theme, and go to Preferences Color Theme, you get this menu now. And as you arrow through this menu, you'll see that it just changes the theme in real time. So it's really easy to kind of check out the different themes that you have available to you. Some of them are pretty well-known themes. Others are things that VS Code team created themselves. And you can notice this one actually changes the colors of the UI. And this is really new. I think this has just happened in the latest release, right? Where some themes have the ability to change the UI elements. So uh, this is pretty pretty nice. This is kind of bringing VS Code to where a lot of other, uh, other editors like Sublime Text and Atom are currently. Um, so I have my own recommendation for a workbench theme, and that is the Sapphire theme that uh, Daniel made recently. And uh, this is a nice dark blue theme and has really cool colors for PowerShell, if I can load up a PowerShell file. So uh, yeah, just go and explore the world of, uh, of themes because there's uh, some really cool stuff that you can find out there. I'll go put it back to the dark plus. All right, and um, you can also do icon themes. So as you might notice here, um, the file browser is a little boring. Uh, you see just the names of files. There's really no icons or anything. If you hit Control Shift P and type uh, theme again, you'll see that there's this file icon theme command. If you run that, then you get another list of potential icon themes. Then if I go and change one of those themes, you can see now I've got little folder icons, little file icons, really basic. And then there's this SETI uh, icon theme that comes with uh, VS Code that has even more sort of specific file type icons. Then you can install icon extensions from the marketplace that have even more icons. So if I go to this VS Code icons extension uh, icons, you can see that we have PowerShell file icons, you have add bear icons, Git icons, all sorts of icons. So uh, there's probably a lot more of these out there. So definitely go you know, search around, see what you, what, what you find. The uh, VS Code icons extension is uh, pretty popular. So uh, this one is pretty good. I think a lot of people use it. So if, you, if you're interested in getting one just to get started, you can use that one. All right, so let's see what else we got here. Okay, finding and installing, in, installing extensions. Um, I'm gonna run through this really quick because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, if you click this icon here on the left side, it gives you the list of extensions you currently have installed. You can see that there's an extension here that needs to be updated, so it makes it really easy to, to figure out what's going on with your extensions. Uh, it has a little update indicator as well. Um, if you wanna search for an extension, so let's say Python, just type that. And then you'll see all the Python related extensions and you get information. Like if you click on one of these, it gives you um, the details of the extension, the ratings, the number of downloads, the readme, the change log, the uh, things that it contributes like settings, et cetera. It's really helpful. So if you don't like to get out of the editor, you can do all of your extension searching here um, and get a pretty good experience. Um, you can also hit this drop down to see things like show popular extensions. So if you want to see like what the most popular extensions are, then you have a list here. And you can see the PowerShell's in the list, which is pretty cool. Um, and sort by rating, show recommended extensions. There's this concept of recommended extensions. If you open a file that VS Code sort of knows there's an extension for that, it will suggest that you can install it really easily. You may have seen it before if you've uh, opened a PowerShell file in VS Code before installing the PowerShell extension. Uh, you can also update them uh, and uh, remove them if you need to. And there's also a, a setting that's helpful for automatically updating your extensions uh, if there is an update to one. So if I go to this real quick and type extensions, there's extensions that auto update. So if you turn that on, it will automatically install the update and it will just tell you to reload whenever an extension is, uh, is installed. Um, so we'll just skip over that right now. So let's, let's talk a little, sorry? Yeah, do you know if there's any thought about like offline extension installation? Um, so you can package them up in a base six file and then install them by dragging them into the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing that I do with the PowerShell extension right now is when I make a release, uh, 
on my GitHub repo, I have a releases page and I update this dot, sorry, I upload this dot v6 file to that repo so that you can download the extension package individually and then go install it into VS Code. So if you hit Control Shift P and type VSIX, there's this extensions install from VSIX and you just give it a file path and then it installs it. So that's a way that you can just throw some V6 files onto a USB stick and put it on another machine and then install it from there. So for now, that's kind of the best approach, uh, but I would definitely like to think about ways to make that easier. Yeah. You might just annotate that somewhere on the blog because I spent hours trying to figure out how to do it. I did it a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I took the URL from, I think, the marketplace and kind of figured out how to package it. Yeah, a few people have done that. Yeah, um, so whenever I do the full documentation for the PowerShell extension, I'll at least mention that there. I think that the VS Code doc site has information on that as well. Um, it does, it's not easy to understand. You kind of got to dig and dig and dig and dig. Yeah, okay, uh, it's somewhere around, but yeah, yeah it's, it's not easy to find, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so everything related to PowerShell now. So let's talk about the, the PowerShell extension. Um, so the PowerShell extension has uh, general IntelliSense um, with parameter set signatures and document, documentation strings. So if I go into, these icons are really freaking me out now. If I go into this invokeplaster.ps1 file, and uh, let's say I go here, I want to type get process. I see that we have get process, we have the signature information, and I'm also calling get help to get the help string, but I think this is not showing up. I may not have installed help on this machine yet. Um, but it, as soon as you type that, press space, then you start to see the, uh, the param set signatures themselves. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can make this pop up a lot more useful. We just haven't gotten to it yet, but uh, ultimately I would like to show like the get help information right here in markdown rendered form. Um, and also whenever you're typing parameters, we can highlight the parameter that you're currently typing. Um, it's not working now, but it will be working in pretty near future. Um, let's see. So syntax and rule-based analysis, we've already seen that you can get uh, little squigglies around your code whenever you have syntax problems or the green squigglies whenever you violate script analyzer rules. Uh, one of the nice things is that you can configure which script analyzer rules get run by having a script analyzer settings.psd1 file. And this is just a PSD1 with uh, some configuration settings. Um, all this information is on the PS script analyzer repo. Kapil's here, he uh, worked on this feature. Um, so you should be able to configure what rules get run. Um, you can disable certain rules if you don't like them. We had to disable a whole bunch of them in the very beginning because it was just too wild. Like we were marking everything and it was getting kind of crazy. So uh, we took that out. Um, also the code fixes we showed with a little yellow light bulb, that's a pretty cool thing. We wanna start adding more code fixes. So if there's any ideas you have for little quick fixes we could do in the code, uh, please file an issue on our GitHub repo. I'll show you a link to that. Actually, why don't I just do it right now? This uh, VS Code PowerShell. So github.com slash PowerShell slash VS Code dash PowerShell. Uh, a lot of activity here. A lot of people find them really good issues. I really enjoy getting feedback and uh, interacting with you folks here. So <laughs> give us all your ideas for quick fixes or any other features that you have. Um, and also one thing we want to do soon is have like a command that you can run that would just automatically do all the fixes and formatting in the current file so that you don't have to, to bother going and clicking all the little light bulbs. Uh, we also showed code, code formatting uh, at the Lightning demos. Uh, that's a pretty cool new feature. A lot of people seem to like it. Um, we're also trying to improve that one a lot. So if you've got specific things that it does wrong in your code, like you try to run the code fa formatter and most things are right, but there's like two lines that it just does something completely bonkers, just tell us and we'll fix it. Kapil's really fast about fixing these issues. So um, that, that all can be uh, dealt with pretty, pretty easily. Just don't get us into a discussion about whether we want to use cuddled else, else's or not, because uh, that's always a bad time. But I can see that Joel's not paying attention. What do you want? Do you want to start a fight here? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole file formatting works. Oh, yeah, whole file formatting does work. Yeah, it's just um, it would be nice if all the other things did work too, like replacing aliases, et cetera. There's actually, we do have a command right now that Doug Fink committed, uh, contributed that is, allows you to do whole file alias replacement, but I would like to generalize that for any other types of quick fixes that we can do. Um, so that should be helpful. Any other, any other questions? Okay, so we also have basic symbol renaming. I think we're really running out of time here. Actually, maybe I'll just skip through some of this stuff because we should talk about debugging for just a second. Um, Integrated console, you guys saw that stuff at the Lightning demos. Uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to find me afterwards. I'm happy to answer. 
Uh, debugging is kind of interesting because this has been one of the things uh, traditionally a little bit hard to configure in VS Code. Now it's a lot easier. You should, for mo in most cases, you should just be able to press F5 and it will debug the current file that you have open. But there are other scenarios that you might be interested in, like debugging a module. You want to be able to import your module and then run a command in the module and then have a breakpoint that gets hit within that module. So if you go into, um, actually, open the debugger pane. I think the control shift D may be the command for this. And you'll see that there's this little wheel here. And if you haven't created a launch.json for your project already, if you click this, it will create one for you for PowerShell. And we come with some um, default configurations built in, like uh, the interactive session, debugging pester tests, launching a specific file, or just launching the current file. Um, so these are kind of the scenarios that we support at the moment. I'll close this out. So uh, the interactive session debugging is kind of the, the important one because if I go and uh, put a breakpoint in invoke plaster, let's just put this right about here, then I can run the interactive debugging session. If I hit F5 now, so I, I went and selected that here. You want to make sure you select the right uh, uh, debugging configuration before you go into the debugger. So it put us into the console, and now we can type whatever we want. We can call set PS breakpoint to set breakpoints, and then do things that cause them to get hit, etc. So if I import plaster, uh, uh, see source. And now if I type uh, invoke plaster and template path, I think examples, new module, destination path, C temp, whatever. Now you'll see that uh, the breakpoint in the module gets hit. So uh, this actually allows you to do module debugging, which is something that wasn't possible in the past in uh, VS Code. So that's pretty useful. Uh, you can also step through the module. So I can just hit F11 and keep stepping into all of this stuff. And it goes to whatever files that you run into. You can hover over variables and see what they are. Um, you can even hover over complex variables and uh, dig into them. So this is a pretty awesome feature of VS Code. You can actually go into objects and look at them in real time, which is pretty cool. And I think even in this view, you can, OK, I think this one doesn't let you do it, but this view over here, you can, you can edit variable values uh, in, the, in this view. You can set watch variables as well, uh, so that whenever you're stepping through, you can see when the variables change. Uh, you also see the call stack, which is pretty helpful. And I think I need to fix this bug. But, uh, but overall, it's pretty, pretty nice. You can also do uh, debugging of your, of your pester tests. So by default, it just runs invoke pester on your current folder or your workspace folder. So if I hit F5, it starts running my uh, pester test in the integrated console. And then as soon as it hits that breakpoint, it'll stop. So now you can debug your module with respect to your pester tests. You can also debug your tests themselves. Uh, so that's a pretty useful thing you can do in VS Code. And let's see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. Ah, there's another cool little thing that just happened in VS Code recently where you can do uh, debugging of pipelines. So you can see where you're at currently in a pipeline. So if I open this examples folder, I think I have a one here already. All right, let's let this guy load. So I'm going to hit F5 here. And we're going to stop at this breakpoint. Now I'm going to hit F11 to step in. And now you see that this little yellow arrow says we're at this point in the pipeline. So I'm going to keep, keep hitting F11. And now you see that we're at right host. And I hit F11, and now we're at the end bracket. And you can even hover over the dollar underbar and see what's in that. So it's really helpful for debugging pipelines. Pretty awesome. And you can just keep, uh, pretty awesome, right? So you can just keep f 11 all the way through that, all the way down. So it's pretty cool. So I'll hit Q to bounce out of that. And that did not work. Um, also, another thing that I found that was kind of cool is uh, if you say, like, write host, and then you have, like, a get process, whatever. Yeah, let's just say get process. Yeah, so if you have a string and you've got expressions, sub-expressions inside that string to print them out, uh, you can step into those as well. So I'll hit F5, then I'll hit F11, and it jumps right into the sub-expressions. So uh, I don't know. I mean, I think this is pretty awesome. I think you could do this in the ISE to some degree, but you don't get this level of like indication of where things are going uh, in the pipeline. So uh, I think we're getting to a point now where the, the debugging experience is vastly superior to what we had before in the ISE, and we're gonna, only going to get better from here. So definitely 
keep an eye on it and uh, let me know if you run into any weird issues because I'm sure you'll see some. Um, but uh, yeah, so in closing, I think that's pretty much it. I've got a couple other resources here. I'm gonna um, put this whole markdown file in a gist and I'll tweet it out. So if uh, you wanna see some of this stuff uh, for later, you'll be able to, uh, to get to it. But I would just like to say I really appreciate all of the great feedback uh, that you guys have been giving, especially all the enthusiasm about the extension after the introduction of the integrated console. It's felt very good for me and also for Keith Hill uh, and for Keith as well, Keith Hill, who also works on this with us. Um, I'm really happy and, and optimistic about what we can do with this in the future. So uh, definitely keep, uh, keep filing those issues and keep uh, let me know, you know what kind of things you'd like to see in the future because we're, we're listening and we want to make this thing the best uh, PowerShell editing experience we can. So uh, any further questions? I think we're out of time, but anything else? Cool. Thanks so much, guys.